pour info, Tristan, il n'est pas là aujourd'hui. Tu le vois, mais il n'est pas là. Tu sais, c'est pas grave, hein, la salle risque de rester allumée. Euh, Est-ce qu'elle peut nous donner son code Pour enlever la mise en veille. Elle a pas un truc dentaire hein Non, mais elle a mis la mise en veille. Ah non, non, elle l'a pas mis, elle a pas envoyé son premier truc. Ouais, hein.
Voilà, parfait. Chers amis, Monsieur le Président de l'Association régionale des cités jardins d'Île-de-France, chers collègues. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, always a pleasure to have you here. It's always complicated to start in the morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, directors of the theater that uh, you have invited us here, Ms. Didier and Caroline, ladies and gentlemen, the speakers, uh, thank you very much for being here today. Valérie, my colleague uh, that follows up uh, this event, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, it's a great pleasure to have you here for this uh, event uh, in Cité Jardin sur Anne. One could make a comparison between the city and the quarter because uh, it's a common project uh, to open uh, space to culture and uh, patrimony. Let's go back to history and uh, understand better how our city is part of uh, Surin uh, mutations uh, during the centuries, 1920 Richelieu. Our famous ancestor saw that a city garden is a nice promise to have a nice home with uh, gardens and uh, respond to the crisis of uh, lodging. The city of garden is a modernity, and you can see it is something that is an advantage for the needs of the population. And you will see the steps of a vision for the day. If the city has uh, understand uh, that uh, we have sport areas uh, and areas uh, for the bourgeois, like this theater, it helped as well to be useful for Richelieu and retirement home that you will discover this evening, because I know that you're going to have a walk over there and visit uh, city gardens and uh, the main great uh, constructions. On rehabilitation, my previous mayor, since 2000, 1986 uh, till 1996, uh, has uh, received the labels for its uh, uh, wealth and uh, for the areas uh, that it's so beautiful to be there. We are here, a company called Habitat, that is the ownership of uh, this uh, Evolutions. Uh, when you have a city garden, it's important to live there and ask yourself, uh, what is a city garden or a garden city? And uh, ask yourself, uh, what is the advantage of a new dynamic in the construction of our territories? Uh, living there or having uh, landscapes uh, is something so that will be the questions uh, of this uh, event. Uh, asking oneself what are the choices for architecture and environment and buildings. What is the specificity of having the people able to appropriate themselves to the city in a different way? I would like as well today to ask yourself what is the reconciliation between the city and the nature from the concepts of Howard that is the core question. Maybe city gardens are the future of the towns so that we have nature in the cities as a standard practice in surin it makes sense to organize this event city gardens are our policy and in the core of our ambitions so that everybody can live well <coughs> in harmony so that uh, we have a conviviality and live with this great architectural treasure and be able to continue to do the same practices everywhere in Surin and in all other cities around. Being in a city, feeling like a village and being so proud of these infrastructures. We work together with Ramirezo and the organization of our homes so that we can keep our patrimony that, thanks good, is protected for the energy of our century. Patrimony is something very important that you can see in our urban and social museum. We have the director here. And the heritage is important so that the younger generation can understand 
what are the challenges of this project. Uh, I also have uh, the mayor and uh, other people that are responsible for urbanism and uh, heritage, as well as our conservatorist uh, Meridien Guillaume, who is uh, responsible for conservation of our patrimony in uh, Surenne. I'm thinking especially about my dear Elena and Jean-Pierre Espo, who is uh, in charge for culture. He has been elected and uh, support us a lot in the city gardens. Uh, he was the first president of the association, and uh, he has been working hard. And as I said, he was a major pillar for our walks. I think uh, Olivier Caroline for this event uh, and that we have been invited here in the heart of this uh, garden city. And uh, Caroline, I'm uh, sure that the next generation will continue to integrate uh, this uh, uh, theater that was initially a room for events with its aesthetical ambitions into the city again, open to the city, and reintegrate all the inhabitants to the questions of accessibility to culture, which is an important idea in this city. And we can see it. Thank you, Mr. President, as well. As uh, Association of uh, Ile de France, uh, Ville Cité Jardin, our uh, well beloved uh, director, the director Milena, who is here, Nuri Moran again with uh, Marie Louise Saussure, and uh, all the members of the city hall and scientific organizations uh, that uh, we thank for this uh, great organization of this magnificent uh, event. I thank all the people that came from Europe and even farther. And thanks to internet, we can have people participating online with Australia. I hope it will work well. And I do understand it will be very late or very early in the night. I hope uh, that this event and the laboratory help us to better understand, organize our cities with our inheritance uh, in the cities uh, and you in a very rare event uh, where acts are already done and i wouldn't say you just need to read them but it will be great to be able to enjoy living in a garden city Thank you, dear mayor, dear colleagues. It was a great introduction. Thank you for being invited in this theater, Jean Villac. It's a great event. I have been here many years ago, and you organized a festival for dance, I believe, here. And it was an opportunity for me. I was younger those days, and uh, I accompanied uh, young dancers uh, over the area Saint Sandery. And it was a great uh, event. I have very nice feelings. Uh, I will say just a few words uh, because your program is very rich. Uh, and I would like to repeat everything. Uh, but uh, let me allow to say a few words as a president uh, of the organization. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here for the opening for this international event of uh, Cities Gardens uh, or Garden Cities uh, of the 21st century. And thank you, dear colleagues, and dear Guillaume, for the invitation. Uh, thank you for all the members of the scientific uh, organization, Valérie Boutoir, and the City Hall of Surenne. We walk together. And I believe as well that the, the presence of uh, other people from Champigny and other cities uh, are important to be here to start uh, this uh, event. Allow me to say a few words uh, and dedicate uh, this international event uh, because of the energy that has been uh, used uh, with a lot of determination uh, and coherence and uh, uh, common work uh, 
that has been done with many people and who would never be able to have this international event. So I would like to dedicate Jean-Pierre Spohr, who is my dear friend, and Elena as well, and David, who are here in this room today. It's a great pleasure, because every time I think about Soren, I think about uh, Jean-Pierre, and it will be stay like that for long time, because it's great. You continue the walk. Uh, Jean-Mier had started the walk, and I am doing uh, much less. I was admiring what he had as an energy deploying and uh, being coherent and, and conviction with all the partners. He has walked uh, so many years, so I learned so many things thanks to him. And I'm sure somewhere from there where he is today, he's observing and maybe he can send some feedback, uh, some critics, uh, uh, whatever. And we will hear very carefully what he has to say. These are uh, days uh, organized by Cité Jardin Association to better understand the history of architecture and its role in uh, garden cities and the life of people living in these cities. Uh, and I know it is uh, a common understanding uh, for most of us. Uh, and understand uh, the story of the workers, which is unique. Uh, uh, that uh, people were born in these uh, city gardens uh, and create this uh, utopic uh, universe uh, that uh, we wish to keep on uh, in a world that uh, sometimes suffers a lot. Uh, this event uh, was thanks to the mobilization of all the main partners uh, that uh, work with uh, city gardens, uh, members of the association, uh, Sponsors that are very important, they have supported us and accompanied us uh, in a very specific way and in a very strong way. I would like to thank uh, DRAC and uh, Région de France, Union Sociale pour la Vita, Caisse de dépôt de consignation, Conseil départemental, Saint Saint Denis, Conseil départemental, Hudson, and other partners. And mainly, of course, all these uh, partners that you can see, some of the logos here, and uh, professionals from culture and heritage that uh, work and uh, help us to improve the cities. I would like to thank the members of the scientific uh, committee that are famous and uh, work uh, in this dossier since uh, many months already. I would like to say Maria Castimovalon, Jean Croen, Stefan de Courtois, Yostitek, Douai, Julie Faure, Anko Franck, Pauline Frile, Jabelle Cournet, Bertrand Lemoin, Christine Lecomte, Amina Sedali, Stefan Ward, Damien Vanoschek, Josh Diti, Bertrand Dullier, Unifan. I'm sorry if some names are not pronounced correctly. And all these people uh, have participated in the preparation and the publication of articles because it's a very rich program with so many people with a scientific uh, approach and uh, the work of all these uh, persons. Obviously, I would like as well to uh, send greetings uh, to the work that has been done since almost two years now with the scientific committee that allowed us to our live uh, to this event as it is and uh, it's a pleasure to know all these things today so I would like to thank especially Gillette uh, who is here today among us uh, Frederic Alexandre of the University of Sorbonne Paris Nord Bernadette Champlon of École Nationale Supérieure from Versailles, Marseille, Laurent Coudroy from Lille, from Urbanism School, Marie-Pierre and Guillaume from Musée de Suresnes, who works in a permanent way, Valérie touché du from Elsanne, Alain Befide, Sébastien Jaco from uh, Paris One Sorbonne University, Charlotte Saint Jean, that everybody knows here, and Plain Commune Association that we work together, Benoît Bureau from uh, the Department of Saint Saint Denis, and uh, we also have a Millennial Association being here with us today, and the new member uh, called Noemi with uh, an apprentice. Uh, Marie Louise, so many important people working in the preparation of this event. I also thank uh, Maud, 
that uh, coordinated uh, the association. I would like also to thank uh, the city of Surin and to the city hall that uh, has uh, prepared and uh, proposed the hospitality for this event. Uh, and the theater of Surin, you said the names, Mr. Director and his team are here, communication team of the city and the city of Surin. Uh, it's uh, fantastic uh, how you have accompanied us to this uh, walk. I would like uh, to thank uh, the creators of this event uh, that uh, share their uh, presentations, the speakers, and everybody that is here today as an institution. Otherwise, we would never be able to have this event uh, because it's a very important event, uh, not only an event in Surin. It's an international event, and uh, the members of all these associations, uh, and I would like uh, really to thank everybody and wish you all a very successful event. And the bonus is it's a result of a long walk of valorization, rehabilitation of uh, city gardens, uh, and the opportunity to continue this walk uh, in a great uh, way with the desire of uh, an utopia in urban and social dimension. And I will invite you all to discover the way we have this uh, great uh, city gardens that we will discover tomorrow. In a few minutes, we will have some beautiful slides. And thank you very much again for being able to be with you here today. Thank you very much. The concept of city gardens started at the end of the 19th century with an award. City and country must wed with this healthy union. A new hope is born, a new life, a new civilization is born. This idea of the garden cities it became more concrete and was disseminated quickly throughout the world in Europe and the US in Australia and Canada. A valorization action saw, came to the day in 1914 in a museum in Edgeworth based on the plans of Barry Parker. Then there's an interest in city gardens around the 20th century with other proposals for urban uh, uh, adjustments occurred. This urban experience was uh, updated and upgraded in the, latest, in the last quarter century. In France, the government started a certain number of actions in the 80s to ensure the protection of city gardens in the greater Paris area with the enrollment of these sites and recognition of their architectural and urbanistic value through an, an, a rolling itinerary and the first colloquium on city gardens 60 years later. The first European meeting took place in 93 in Toulouse on a city garden cities in Europe. In 98, in the 100 year anniversary of the uh, uh, first award, there was an exhibition on the city gardens um, with a colloquium in Seren. This took place in cooperation with the Na National Higher School of Education in Belleville. All of the symposium had a place, including the Cornell U University, uh, the 100 year anniversary in the US. Started in 2008, areas uh, took place, uh, there was an event at Stan in, in 2013, in right here, in Seren, in the Museum of France, approved by the state, the only institution devoted to garden cities in the greater Paris area. Other colloquia will take place in France, in Reims, Reims in Paris, in Great Britain, with the Town and Country Planning Association, and in Portugal, with for the recognition and asking the question about the future of garden cities. Many uh, players, experts, architects, urbanists, uh, landscapers, mediators, and political figures are interested. The, the way they look at things changes every 100 years. So we've introduced, along with Charlotte Saint-Jean, who is a, a moderator in architecture and heritage in many towns, we wanted to introduce this first day on recognition and valuation of city gardens or garden cities. So I'm going to hand over to Charlotte so that she can present the participants in the first morning's proceedings. 
Thank you, Marie-Pierre. Hi, everyone. Since we are in the first half day, I'm going to go quickly over, because Nomi said that we're very late, um, so how we're going to be organized in this morning's proceedings. And you will see that the other half days will be organized in the same way. So we're going to have a first time, a, a very qu quick introduction, thanks to Marie-Pierre, to have a brief overview of the topic. There will be a, a small, a similar introduction by all of the uh, pairs that are preparing each presentation during the morning's proceedings and this afternoon's proceedings. So first of all, in our half day, is going to be devoted to communication, uh, roughly 10 to 15 minutes. That will be followed by exchanges with the, with the floor. So do please hop in. Uh, write down your questions so that we, you can intervene after each of these communications. Subsequently, right before the exchange, we'll have a panel discussion with the various speakers, and that will be moderated by Milene Crespo from Saint-Quentin. All of this will bring us up to a, a well-deserved break um, and to continue these exchange uh, around a cup of coffee at lunch and, and lunch is later on. For our topics, I'm going to call up our four the first uh, speakers the, and the four first communications that we'll be leading with the whole topic of recognition and the valuation of city gardens based on a certain number of precise examples. I'd like to call to the floor in, uh, in the order in which they will speak, Yolaine Coutantin for Saint-Brieuc, who is a conservator of a patrimony and head of the Archi Archives and Heritage Service in the city of Saint-Brieuc, Benedict Chaljube, who is architect and who is with Amélie Flamand, who is a sociologist, and they are both um, lecturers at the University of Architecture in Clermont-Ferrand. They're going to talk about the Michelin city in Clermont-Ferrand. Then we'll be going over the French border to go on to Belgium in Brussels with a speech by Eric Henno, who's an hist art historian and, and uh, curator at the um, Brussels Museum. And then we'll go to the Czech Republic, to Prague, with the art historian and researcher at the Institute of Art History in the Czech Academy of Sciences to plunge into Czech garden cities uh, with Vendula Njivo. Njivo. So we're going to have to do some timekeeping with Marie-Pierre. It's roughly 15 to 20 minutes speech, and you'll have to uh, uh, leave some time for the slides. Yelen, perhaps you could start. I am in charge of archives and, and heritage in the city of Sambria. I work on archives, basically, and started working on a candidacy for the label of cities of history, and I was asked to take charge of the heritage side. And that it is that from that angle I'm going to be speaking. My thoughts have to do more with the intrinsic logic of a garden city. How is, is a garden city organized compared to the city around? Because the paradox of a city garden in Jongle and Saint-Brieuc is that it's the only city garden in, 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 in Brittany, and people don't even know about it. So we're going to try to look into that uh, paradox. And I know it's international. Saint-Brieuc is the center of the world, as, as we all know. But I'll, let's have a look at where it is, the north co coast of the western side of France. Cambrieux and the Paris-Brest line, is a, that's a, an important road and rail access in the, our history. Saint-Brieuc is on the seaside, but in, uh, at the bottom of a cliff, and Saint-Brieuc has a deep valley. And the question is going to be central in the history of city gardens is that very deep Guidic Valley, which goes to the sea. And the city garden is on the right-hand side of that w valley. And on the left, we have the, the historical center. And you can see the rails 
in the, um, uh, the railroad. I'm assisting on the Valley of Good Igris. You can't imagine that they have a problem of relief, uh, you know, geographical relief. It's a very deep valley, in fact. You have a city garden which is well positioned in a plateau with uh, maritime air uh, entries, uh, with air and, and water and so forth. You know the principle. And this historical center is, is built around a cathedral in a, in a, in a swamp, swampy area. Now, one of the problems is we're going to have a hard time joining the city garden to the rest of the city. And we have also, we'll be seeing as well that that swampy area plays a role in history as well. We have the sea on the right. It's a historical center around the cathedral with the buildings from the 15th century, the Valley de Guidic, and then in 63, the train arrives and the Industrial re Revolution with it. And so the, below, you have the heavy industry in between the station and, and the cathedral and so forth requires less space. It's the European capital of the of fine uh, paintbrushes and the population would installed around the cathedral with old buildings that became um, a, a slum basically. It was uh, unhealthy because it's very humid because of the swampy area and the very bad quality of buildings. Gabriel de Garçon it was a resident of the public office of HBM. They decided that that city garden, he'd, and, and this the plateau area on the right were former uh, locations, but um, it's basically a rural village and a maritime uh, village. And right next to the city garden, there's a little square that you can see, which is the seminar, which is a kind of a closed area. So this is really not much, it's, it's basically nothing. On the left, you have the seminary. On the right, you have the city garden, which is kind of in the middle of nowhere. So it wasn't a bad idea. He wasn't uh, silly because it's a suburb, right? It's, there's a city garden that was built. You can see it. There's no production unit near there. You have to go on the other side of the valley. So everything is in blue. It wasn't done yet. The, the boys wanted to do an extension the ancestor of our urban planning. And the, here's the extension with the bridge that was planned and a whole uh, area which linked the city garden to the rest. Now, when the, the project was done before the war, and the war actually interrupted the process. Uh, <clears throat> and then subsequently, that's the city garden. I'm not going to get into all the details of Jean Galin. It looks like there's a common house with a, 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 a room for shows. It's a sort of, there's a bit of moral control of workers and so forth. So there's a shared house and on either side of that, you have the collective areas, community areas, which were in the middle of nowhere, right in the middle of the fields. So there's very urban signal in the middle of the field. So that was interrupted. A little note about the style, because this ha explains a bit why the city garden was dissolved in urbanism. Le Guelec, who's the architect who built the city, he was known for his uh, New Britain uh, uh, buildings. You have individual houses are in the same neo-Norman style that you find a lot in the, during this period. And next to that, I have the impression that we kind of forced him to try to do a little bit of our deco. It's the same as they we have a common, a shared house. And I, I, like, I, really, I really like, because we have the impression, we asked him to make a flat roof, but he wanted to do a, a, a sloped roof, so he did it halfway between both. So it's uh, unusual, Art Deco. And Le Guelec is also kind of archaic in the apartments. The apartments is, were, uh, rooms connected one after the other, which isn't practical. And you have the toilets. Before, you had a glassed-in area. You had to go through the back balcony to go to the toilet. So rural population uh, felt they had to actually go through go out in the cold to go to the bathroom. So it's a difference in style, which means that visually this is incomprehensible. So that's a, a renovation project at the top. So you have the, co the collective area the original design, the current status, and this is going to be a return uh, to uh, a more original decoration. This is interrupted by the war at this point, and then after war, after the war, everybody realized that a bridge is missing in the legislative arsenal 
there was a possibility of, of having a long-term loan to have access to the ZOOP. So they said, well, the first thing we need is, is to do it next to the city jardin. It was just to the west of the city garden, and we call that the Balzac area. It's really housing. We are having a baby boom at this time, but we weren't thinking about something that would be a community site or a shared you know, area. We're interviewing people who live in the city garden and people who live in the area in Balzac. We don't have the same quality of life. So what does the city garden become? Well, it's, it's been disenclaved. It's going to disappear in people's minds. And very concretely, there are buildings that are destroyed, that are torn down, and constructions that have nothing to do with the intelligence of the initial architecture. And I'd like to pay tribute to Jean-François Briand, who was an architect made in 83, who ran a study, and which was useful to all of us, because without him, we would no longer understand what it used to be. He, and all of the documents that I have came from his study. What's surprising is that in 83, the city garden no longer existed. It had no more meaning. And, and despite that, it's thanks to him that we will have this whole history. So the buildings in the Grand Ensemble at Balzac was built very quickly, as was the case of everything in the 60s. And they're concretely being torn down as all of the Grand Ensemble have the same problem. In the 2000s, there's an urban renewal uh, uh, took place, and that's where the city garden woke up again, and we go back into that uh, neighborhood, which is, uh, there's a lot of sort of, uh, a group called the Petit des Boyards, and the purpose is to democratize this type of approach and as, as a kind of a heritage, to propose to children to discover uh, uh, garden cities and the Grand Ensemble of, of de Balzac and the medieval quarter and different types of buildings with the CUA. And we come into that neighborhood invited into this project. VERT, the garden, in the shared uh, gardens and shared compost, they set up in the city, invited by the community right next to the city garden. And this is a return to nature in the city, and the return of this whole of thought about green things. And um, you, you can see the little rectangle to the north of the city garden. That's where we have the seminar. But starting in 2017, it was, no, it was called the, the Maison Centive. And the diocese did a lot of work on that building, which is superb. It's an Art Deco style, and which opens up because it became a media tech. Uh, a, a, a place for welcoming people for exhibitions. And the architect which did this uh, turned the building back to where it was. The entry used to be to the north and turned the back to the city garden. And now they turned it around to the south. And the entrance is in the south. And when I told this to the person, it's great you're opening that up on that side. And she looked at me to say, yes, but I don't know what to do with it. What are you talking about? And you'll see that that others thought about what to do about it afterwards. So in the city, we were going after this label of city and city of history. And we haven't got it yet, we're working on it, but the whole urban aspect of, of Belleville and the heritage sectors of, of note were validated in July last. And in this framework, the city garden became a whole set of interest uh, of, of con and continuity of interest. It was an inventory of the lab label of the 20th century so that the city garden could be contemporary architect architecture of note and en enrolled in historical monuments. You're going to say, this is all wonderful. So it's preserved then. So what are you worried about? Except that in Sombria, we have the sad privilege of seeing a historical monument that's classified who have it destroyed. We had a bridge that was classified as a historical monument that was in the way, and nobody wanted to restore it, so the, the state declassified it, and it was destroyed. Well, we thought that the city garden was going to be protected. I said, I don't believe it. Sorry, I don't believe it. So what can we do so, th so that heritage can be preserved? And for me, you have to give, them a, give that place a meaning, a shared meaning. We have to give it a kind of a, a meaning to the community. For me, the city is the natural biosphere of the human being. We've built our milieu, but we also have to tame that milieu. And that's where working in this neighborhood, we, we meet people that live there. I don't want to deflower the subject because Annika, who's going to talk about it later, 
and she is um, helps people visit that area. And the Santiv House, which they identified as being a point of interest from a heritage point of view as well. And so I'm trying to go fast and I'm, I'm confused. The idea was to link uh, the city garden with the area around and uh, say and ask how are these people being uh, here, how do they live, uh, have them uh, talk and show where the pharmacy is and where everything is. And some people lived in this city garden and it's obvious it was something interesting on the history. And they came to our caves uh, to see Jean-Francois Miron memories and they never asked me any things. And actually that made me feel happy because those people took their right of culture and what does it mean? Culture has the idea of Malro, who is the acquisition of uh, big subjects uh, professionals of culture will deliver uh, something to the citizens. Uh, and we are used uh, to this uh, logic. Uh, he created the paradise of Le Havre for workers, uh, but the right of workers starts from the idea and the assumption of the definition of a larger culture, what does it mean that we are humans, uh, that we are linked uh, by ideas like UNESCO that are promoted? Uh, we have uh, cultural rights that you will find in different laws, uh, that everyone is allowed to take the right to be a cultural being. I live in the city, it's great, but I would like to know more. They decided it themselves, and that is really great that the citizens decided by themselves to go and inform themselves what are we going to do in the Cité Jardin of Exclan tomorrow. We can see the projects of restoration and we renew the renovation project of uh, the buildings. Uh, we're not trying to make only a museum that is closed. It's not the idea of a dynamic to stay. Even if within half an hour you can walk uh, through the uh, city, garden, people have great ideas how to improve it. But uh, for me, before that the buildings uh, are part of a city garden that is a utopy, I always believe that the dream of an utopy was much bigger. A dream of a paradise, uh, uh, better live together. That is a dream that always existed, and I believe we can live with it, uh, but we can invest two things. Uh, the process uh, have the dynamic coming top up from the people living there into the city, and from the ideas like Howard, uh, you can see the circular plants. Uh, it's something very closed, uh, and it uh, has a logic of uh, autarky. And uh, we are like a ball of a billiard board that moves, uh, touch each other, and there's a whole evolution on the whole board. And finally, I believe that the idea of knowing uh, is the city garden something that's part of the city. I think it's the city of tomorrow that has to become a city garden. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, and you respected your time. Sebastian reminds me that I didn't say that was a simultaneous interpretation for English-speaking people, and of course as well for the French-speaking people, when later on speakers will be speaking in English. So please go outside and take the headsets, they are available. And now, Emily and Benedict will make the continuation of the presentation Good morning, everybody. We're going to make a presentation of research that we have done uh, one and a half years ago about the city of Michelin. We are not exactly in uh, the uh, Garden City, but today we are in the city of Clermont-Ferrand, uh, where you have a uh, housing stake for the workers, uh, where you have a patrimonialization and transformation of the way people see this as uh, part of the city. Uh, Cité Michelin, to show you on the map, this is a map that you can uh, see from the region around Alpa, where 
we walk uh, with about 30 uh, city gardens uh, within uh, the area made by the company uh, Michelin and uh, most of them were constructed in the 30s uh, but even in the 70s uh, new cities were built uh, because in the 30s uh, we have uh, twin homes uh, and uh, in the 70s we have uh, small buildings uh, for several families. This is something very present in the city. In the 50s uh, we have a an area called uh, Cité Centure, where you will have uh, on the right side the picture in 2021, and you see it has been uh, completely changed by actual uh, urbanization. And this is uh, what you can see from far away uh, in the south of the city. You can uh, understand that this is a project near to the city gardens, but it identifies the city of uh, Clermont-Ferrand, which is almost twin city. There are some uh, questions that we asked ourselves uh, about uh, hypotheses. Uh, these cities have, uh, in the 30s, uh, twin homes uh, made by the company Michelin by an uh, engineer. It's not an architect that creates uh, these uh, buildings. They are constructed in a uh, paternalistic approach. Uh, and it's interesting to say that it was an industrial house. Uh, all homes are east-west oriented, uh, and uh, they have a logic of uh, a big uh, uh, city. It's not a garden city. It's a city for workers. It's not a village that it has been presented uh, by others in the beginning of the century, but in a totally different form. Uh, that's very close to city gardens uh, because these are twin homes with a garden. But also for many people, we have equipment uh, for the Cité de la Plaine uh, with schools, with a cooperative uh, uh, dispensary and a garden for the families uh, that uh, you will have also with public areas. Uh, the name of uh, garden city is used by the city today in the uh, PLU because they characterize it uh, like a garden city. We say that this change uh, is uh, due because of a hypothesis of a critical moment, uh, because there's a major role of different processes uh, for having uh, homes being privatized, first of all, and the process of uh, being more and more present of environment challenges uh, and as well uh, patrimony. Uh, ideas uh, because of uh, Ron uh, and City and the Metropole that are interested to these questions uh, of creating a history city. On site, uh, we had uh, several uh, areas, uh, and the cities uh, were made by the city of uh, a Mishnah or by owners or individual people, we have chosen two areas, uh, one uh, private uh, and one uh, social housing uh, organization, the city Oradou that uh, was used uh, since the 80s. They made a landscape uh, redefinition uh, and called that the Zac uh, of uh, Jardin de l'Oradou. There are 252 dwellings uh, with uh, four homes, uh, it's twin homes for four families. And the second city, you see it's uh, quite unique uh, buildings uh, that uh, this city is only private ownership uh, in the northeast of uh, the city. It's uh, next to the production factory of uh, Kataru with many owners uh, uh, because we have only 160 owners uh, of 80 homes. These are homes divided into two. For the methodology, since uh, Amelie is a sociologue and uh, I'm a historian and architect, uh, we used our both methods uh, to better understand, uh, and we went to the archives to understand uh, the city hall uh, archives because the company archives were not easily accessible. Yes, <laughs> they were not accessible. It seems there's um, secrets in the archives. 
and the main method is what we see on our uh, in situ inquiries. Uh, we try to see what exists today, what is built, uh, how is the garden, and uh, the left, uh, Amelie, and uh, the right side, uh, a colleague, uh, that uh, we met uh, the, the people living there. We started to talk with local actors uh, that uh, manage uh, the city of uh, Michelin. And uh, then we have actors uh, of the transformation of the cities. Uh, and I would say it's a possibility to see this transformation. This is a, s a picture of uh, Santur, it's a private property, and the innovation was necessary for this uh, house because uh, many of these uh, apartments have uh, 73 square meters uh, with a very small um, uh, surface, only 23 meters of surface on three different levels. Uh, on the ground floor you have a common uh, uh, kitchen in one or two rooms. That was the best thing that Comfort would offer those days. Uh, owners uh, would uh, add uh, bathrooms or make extensions uh, that would up to double the surface outside of the house. And these extensions uh, uh, will make the whole thing be more coherent. And you will see on the right side uh, the ownership uh, extension and the left the extension that changes the aspect. In the beginning, uh, we had uh, a coherence, and uh, later on, uh, uh, we have added uh, garages, uh, and these extensions uh, have the reduction of the garden that initially would be 100 to 120 square meters. So you go through the extension, and you see here an example of the garage and the garden is lost, and uh, you don't see it being anymore there. It's the identity of uh, Michelin, and you also lose the gardens that uh, you cannot see anymore. These extensions are, or were very uh, small and do allow to the owners uh, to have a link uh, with the garden that is much more obvious. Uh, in a way to be able to see their gardens, to have a loggia, to be always orientated towards the north sud axe. And in the other slide, you will see in uh, Oradou uh, area, you can see a Cité Jardin because there was a project uh, in the 90s uh, by many architects and uh, local. Uh, uh, approach uh, because we ask ourselves is it possible to have a garden city of a house divided in four and this is in uh, Uradu and the uh, apartments are half a level as you can see from the windows as well uh, fragmentation uh, is important and the renovation allowed it uh, as uh, to have uh, a new balance, create links, uh, create intermediate uh, levels, and get the apartments becoming bigger, and extensions of a garage, you can see on the left, uh, and parking lots. Uh, sometimes we added kitchens uh, above the parking lots. Uh, and what's interesting in this area is that you have a new uh, restyling of uh, the a way that the roads uh, have been uh, designed, uh, the hierarchy of uh, pedestrians and cars. Uh, we are walking about uh, uh, green areas of uh, aligning ink and uh, walk on what I would call the grammar of the gardens. Uh, you will see there's a wooden fence uh, that's part of the work of uh, the architect. Uh, and uh, you can see trees uh, and a little bushes uh, to keep the coherence of the original spirit uh, and maybe uh, reinforce things. Uh, so when we had a closer look uh, of uh, landscape uh, designers, uh, we understood that this is uh, natural uh, heritage that we keep and keep on 
having an agricultural use of the land just uh, next uh, door. And that made the coherence of the whole thing. Uh, so what uh, we believed was uh, very important and big challenges of the gardens and the uses as of today, we still have this uh, balance uh, with the environment, which is important for the contemporary citizen. And uh, we realize uh, that there is a balance between privatization and preservation. And uh, in that way, we have the possibility to see in these gardens uh, you have uh, a small possibility to grow your own uh, vegetable garden. So whenever you leave the factory and you go back home, if you have a closer look, you can see that uh, uh, you still have these uh, little uh, vegetable gardens. They still exist. It's an owner in the Oregon area. and. Uh, people can buy these uh, houses and his owner of his house and of his garden and he invested uh, uh, and uh, created his vegetable garden and he can uh, feed himself uh, all year long uh, with the vegetables from his garden. So you can still see this kind of uh, vegetable gardens and it's maybe not everywhere but some people will uh, use the uh, vegetable and uh, have a minimal uh, of, uh, of uh, situations where you will see other people that uh, will uh, use, of course, the garden as uh, uh, an area of uh, decoration uh, and uh, where you can uh, relax, uh, sit, uh, and it's a usage of uh, the public uh, space that is uh, reused in a different way. And uh, fences uh, are not very high, so you have a visual transference with your neighbors. Uh, you can understand that you can keep uh, social links, uh, and it's an approach of uh, what we call English garden. You also have gardens like this one, where you can uh, say they are bewildered gardens. Uh, we took many pictures, uh, and uh, we understand that either they have difficulties uh, to uh, maintain uh, their garden or maybe they don't have uh, enough uh, money or they're getting older but they still keep on using their gardens uh, and it's a very rich uh, heritage where these gardens could be in the front part or in the back part of the house so in order to keep the ecosystem and the biodiversity with the trees uh, and uh, fruit and uh, vegetables uh, which is a continuation of uh, all the tradition of growing your own fruit, vegetables, uh, uh, raisins, or whatever you would uh, be growing. And uh, there's a very specific uh, cabbage uh, that you will find only in this area. And it was a Portuguese that came to walk in Michelin, and they still have this Portuguese cabbage growing there. That's part of the history of the walkers and not only having local agriculture. These uh, gardens are biodiversity that help to the research of a uh, balance of the biodiversity that we're looking for in this uh, balance of the cities uh, that we're looking today. We are trying to define what could be the future of this uh, city of Michelin. And uh, after a period of partial demolition and transformation, the current situation of the housing estates uh, went through a process of uh, rehabilitation and uh, reconfiguration of public space in connection with the gardens uh, uh, to give an overall uh, coherence and a balance between uh, public, uh, private, uh, and uh, industrial ownership. We know it has been sold to owners. So we have social housing that sells from time to time some of its apartments or houses to keep an heritage to go further of just having a 
balance uh, between the transformation of uh, the society modalities uh, and the wish of people having their own house, uh, their own garden, protected from the pedestrians or the neighbors of feeling well. And these gardens uh, are an intangible heritage uh, of uh, the advantage of uh, having uh, their own vegetable garden and giving the possibility to the kids of our today's society for excuse me these are the other slides of the evolutions uh, that we could see how the gardens are used in different uh, ways uh, and we are still here in Urakadu and we arrived to this logic of uh, privatization that uh, allows the wish as i just said to close oneself uh, be more on an isolation status uh, compared to the neighbors it will not be able to see you and you can see these pictures you see there's a fence the fence is high uh, it was lower before, you see the difference of the colors, uh, and you can still speak with your neighbor when he's on the balcony, but you cannot speak with him when he's in the garden. So you feel being at home when you're in the garden. And uh, these people never knew the great uh, time of uh, Michelin. These people are retired, they spend their life working for Michelin, and they are the origin of uh, this uh, new fence uh, that uh, does not allow anymore to see through. Uh, if you go up a hill, you can see that even some people uh, could create their own uh, pool, and uh, these are private uh, constructions where you feel that people want to live in a better life. And uh, finally, what uh, we said, uh, there's a process of uh, preservation of uh, keeping uh, your possibility of being private. Uh, you have a whole series of uh, privatization in order to allow to the people, because of the plan of urbanism of 2016 and with special provisions so with regard to the characteristics of urban forms, uh, to keep the heritage and the historical value of the vegetation and uh, maintain the architecture of the urban characteristic, uh, but as well an approach much more in the cultural heritage uh, of the young city. Uh, of uh, Ron Alp and the area of 2018 that has a label of a metropole that uh, carries out a dedicated research because in the past uh, they would uh, concentrate more to the Middle Ages, but now they start asking themselves what happened in the 20th century and understand uh, the patrimony of art and historic country. The consensus is that the heritage of the city of uh, Michelin became a garden city and that uh, translated an interest of uh, these uh, areas uh, to have a different approach of the balance between uh, environmental and social issues. In these cities, uh, you see that there are transformations uh, that are very much in depth and as well the challenge uh, from uh, urbanism uh, that we would like something for tomorrow and ask ourselves uh, will this uh, Michelin city be a big advantage uh, for homes but as well living together. Thank you very much. The term uh, garden city includes the word garden, so I'm going to essentially talk about uh, the uh, garden and, and landscape dimension and vegetal dimension. The biggest uh, uh, between two wars created in the Logis Floreal in the Watermail. So this corresponds, in fact, to two cooperative societies 
in low house, uh, low cost housing. One was created in 1921, and Floreal was created in 22. These companies whose land are adjoining called upon the same urbanist and architect, Louis van der Schwalven, who was an architect, chief architect, and Jean-Jules Gerix to create a, a unit between both wars, which counted some 1,200 housing units. The only difference between the two cities and cooperatives were marked a very naive simplicity, but very efficient, including for the child, the young population, by the color of the wooden ends, where there would be window frames and shutters and so forth, it's always green for the logis and always yellow for the floreal. Here we have uh, an overall uh, map of what was approximately done between the two wars. It should be noted that there are three important factors. There's a hierarchy that's very strict uh, for the actual circulation. You have transit uh, traffic, which is routed and as limited as possible. Most of the streets are only for local use with a f complex design, which keeps non-residents out of, out of the way. The most original thing is that there's a third level of, of traffic, which is only for pedestrians, which makes it possible to cross all of the city moving through the uh, other interior areas. The second factor of importance that we can't see on the map is the topography. We have a site which is quite complex and from a topographical point of view. On the up, you have a very sharp slope on the upper part of the San Siena River. And the third element, which is of importance, is the outside aspect, which is extremely irregular, resulting from the ac acquisition policy that was possible at the time. The city is comprised only of small houses, small individual units, two to 15 elements at a time, and notably, so as to deal with the difficulty of perception of the whole of the city due to the outside breakdown, which is quite complex. The main accesses were marked by collective buildings. You see a few examples here on the screen. Upstream to the design of the landscape, we have two main requirements. First of all, savings. The cost of treatment and replacement has to be as low as possible. We avoid uh, anything having to do with annual plants. And as to um, and perennial, uh, perennials had a minimum amount of uh, maintenance. And also, uh, it, it had to have some kind of a, uh, all year round uh, attractiveness contrary to what was being done at the time where we considered that there was a kind of a period where the garden was not used or use was limited during the months of winter. So these two requirements were headed by what you can call a polit political, social, and cultural choice, the idea being that the landscape should incarnate the cooperative ideal of solidarity in the community and is certainly one of the main originalities of this complex. Globally speaking, we use a, a, a restricted number of plants, and we have a specific usage that we're going to see throughout the whole site. You have the uh, Japanese cherry trees, which are basically along the main roads, the Italian poplar, you have the, teo, the linden tree, ash is only used in in um, hedges. As for the architecture, the continuity and type of, of vegetation used is a very strong factor for identification of the city. It appears to be a kind of a counterweight to the complexity of the topogra topography and the complexity of the actual scope of both uh, sites. With respect to the, veg the vegetal plantations, we have uh, Japanese uh, cherry trees this is one of the factors that contributed to the reputation of the Logis Florian. When the cherry trees in Japan were used for alignment and are extended throughout the Western world in Europe and North America, the most famous example is probably 
the 3,000 Japanese cherry trains which were offered in 1912 by Japan to the U.S. Uh, and, uh, as a, a gesture of friendship that were planted on the, on the banks of the Potomac River, as you can see in this picture. In, in terms of the Logis Floreal, we have the actual first uh, uh, planting of these Japanese cherry trees in um, Belgium. Based on the information we have, these were the original uh, Prunus sur le passeur. And, and it was the, we know that this was not the favorite species of uh, those in, in the know. It was found to be a bit banal with a big, intense, intensely pink blossoms. According to the British, they, they qualified these as obscene and vulgar. They considered that they were aggressive and Logis Florial. The, it, the, they played the role ideally, i.e. to create an extraordinary pink cloud above the whole uh, set of buildings, the whole complex. And for several weeks in the spring, this cheap housing could offer a wonderful uh, uh, floral bouquet which existed in no middle class area in the capital or even in the, elsewhere in the country. This was also an, a, 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 a course of social value of great signification and great significance. And these cherry trees are going to be very successful very quickly. And between the two wars, it will be the uh, um, and it would, it's in all of the walking guides, it's announced in the press and, and so forth. About Kanzan now. When we get into the two cities, the community ideals are indicated by the the, the grassy areas, which are developed on a continuing basis, the grass setback areas with ivy cordons. This is a collective uh, appearance around uh, housing units, and this is a radical choice, which in fact will not be followed by many other Belgian designers, so as to free up the view in this long green grassy setback area and the limit with the uh, sidewalk is only marked by a, an ivy cordon by some 20 centimeters wide. You can see a picture from the from the period and with the detail. You can see the way it works. You have uh, uh, you have uh, you have the ivy which is planted at the feet of these little posts, and they uh, grow onto the wires to uh, form that whole set. The only uh, and you have balls of ivy which identify the pathway leading to the homes. Logically, to ensure the perennity of this minimalistic structure and to avoid a, a tendency to fill things up, the maintenance will be handled by the two cooperatives and not by the individual housing dwellers. There's also a visualization of facades. Now, in this practice, the, the only aspect which will enable the outside personalization of the house in an architectural uh, ensemble, there, right from the first phase, so originally, based on the information from archives that we were able to find, it would seem that these facades were, were welcoming uh, uh, vines and roses, but in the articles of the social press at the time, they proposed a broader pos number of possibilities that we see partly today with uh, ivy, uh, wisteria, glycine, and siphon. I'm going to skip the text here, so we don't want to spend too much time. Here's an example of the beginning of the vegetation period an example from the 70s that shows the development that we've often had in these two cities. Another example here. The Logis Floreal is something specific. Some of the lots are quite developed inside. They're irrigated, as I already said a bit earlier, by an elaborate uh, 
pedestrian routing system. In the central portion, uh, these areas are not occupied by gardens, individual gardens. There's a kind of a shared space. Often it has a multi-purpose for di different reasons. It's a, it's a shared uh, community space of life, which is very active to meet people, to have meetings, to have parties, to have cultural activities, to relax, to read. It's a place to play or to play sports for children and adolescents or even adults. It's a place for drying laundry and so forth. In reality, the inside of this area is a collective symbol, which is just as important as the public side of the city. Inside these areas, the most unexpected thing are the alignment from Italian poplars along the, the, the cement pathways. These poplars are on the edge of the hedge between and the garden. They space by roughly five meters, and they designed ver vertical areas depending on various angles. So in the summer, this unusual arrangement modifies totally the hierarchy, uh, uh, the usual hierarchy in the, uh, the routed areas. It, they, they are higher than the roofs, and they're competition, in a way, to the monumentality of these alignments that we see in, in navigable routes. So here you see the difference in scale. It's quite surprising between planting alignments and these very tall Italian poplars that were inside the area. And you can see Van der Sorden's purpose to have all of these shared areas within this area that were really sources of value, which was part of the founding of the project. Another f interesting feature in these areas are fruit trees, mainly apple trees. So instead of creating an, an area to protect fruit trees, what was decided is to use public spaces to have a kind of a, a, a sparse orchard type approach. And this was to participate in the global aesthetic in flooring in the spring, flowering in the spring of cherry trees and apple trees that were ornamental in nature. So fruit trees were part of an ideal of community solidarity. We knew that for many years, uh, just out, and up until just after the Second World, the the sale of fruit sold are called is called an investment fund, so that you could offer a discreet aid to people that were uh, unhoused uh, subsequent to the war. And one last uh, dimension, which is I think important, is the relationship that the Lugifoyal had with the development of new progressist education in terms of the education of children with objects in nature. There are collective spaces inside and out of house, out of house, often that were often sandboxes that were installed around, the, around 1930. It's very interesting to see that these Jardins included the design of these as an educational tool. Here's another example. So the, the housing unit, starting in the 20s, had two uh, uh, nursery schools and a primary school, which, in fact, will be taking advantage of the vegetal environment to set up this whole educational act activity associated with nature. In the articles at the time, we can read that these schools become Cabo di Badini, children's schools, the term we use to designate the Montessori schools. These schools, right from the beginning, had both a courtyard, a garden with grass, and a sandy beach or a sandbox, and small individual gardens where the children could start to experiment with uh, planting various things. Obviously, it is in this framework, this difficult framework, that you see Ovid de Colli, who is uh, at the time had close relationships with the world of housing, the social housing. Two or three minutes, or shall I stop? To conclude, 
a few uh, things about maintenance and the management of heritage. The part of the city built up until 1940 had been classified in 2001. We're talking about a protection which includes both the buildings and the uh, plantations. Now, in, in, during the process, we elaborated a heritage management plan for classified buildings, which has entered into force in 2014, and which simplified significantly all of the work in maintenance and restoration to the extent where, if, in terms of most of the questions that arose, already existed at the time, that there were already solutions available. Now, a management program for vegetal management was designed in 2004, but unfortunately this was never actually implemented by the administration. Doubtless, I say doubtless because the administration never actually justified their non-action because the plan presented a certain uh, a conceptual uncertainty between the heritage management and certain options which were more an affair of the landscaping. So there is not today a plan for managing the whole thing from a planting plantation point of view. In a larger framework, this absence is explained probably by a certain number of problems. First of all, we can point to the considerable lack of historical sources. We, several funds are need to be ex examined. There are many questions that remained about the condition of the vegetation in older times. There are here a, a few years of the changes in the, to the initial situation. The delay setting up a, a vegetable management plan sends back to the priority for, which for a long time was given to deriving value from the architecture rather than from the landscape, whether it be in terms of protection or subsidies. In addition, it would be a bit dishonest to not recognize that the heritage approach to social housing has often had queries that one could call political or moral that were delicate despite the closing of the budgets and specifically insofar as uh, vegetable plantations are concerned that we had a tendency to consider as being uh, uh, access accessories. For the last t 10 years, the last decades, associated with the protection of animals or on the valuation of indigenous species, simplified by sustainable development and, and a, a consistent heritage policy. The idea was to integrate this into the Natura 2000 uh, system to encourage the existence of a Lucanus service and the whole pro recurring problem arose in terms of hierarchy between protection of heritage and the protection of Natura 2000. Uh, uh, and there's an absence of a hierarchy to which we add the problem of the absence of any uh, consultation organization between these two sets of, of uh, legislation which often correspond to opposing and radically opposing uh, positions. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I will be speaking English because my French is not good enough. Uh, in June 1914, Franz Kafka got on a train in his hometown Prague and headed to spend his vacation in Germany. His final destination was Hellerau, a newly founded small settlement in the vicinity of Dresden. Only a couple of years earlier, in 1909, Franz Schmidt, owner of the Deutsche Werkstätten, had established a garden city there. 
But Kafka was not drawn by Hellerau as the first garden city in Germany because the urban reform model was not his focus. The author was not lured by the world environment. He was attracted by the life reform, the culture milieu, the theater festspielhaus, and the reformist performances held on the stage. And also furniture production by the Deutsche Werkstätten since he was planning a household with his fiancé, Felis Bauer. In parallel with Kafka, in the period immediately before the First World War, many Garden City sympathizers traveled to Hellerau to explore the new urban scheme that they sought to introduce in also in the Czech lands. Kafka's holiday highlights that despite the existence of state borders, the intellectual exchange flourished unrestricted in Central Europe. Kafka's passion for Hellerau indicates that the Prague cultural circles were familiar with the new town's existence from its very beginning. Yet despite sharing similar ideas, Prague society was rigidly split according to nationality. Apart from the long-standing Czech-German antagonism, in terms of scholarship, language skills, cultural environment and geographical distance, Germany formed a natural benchmark that mediated the latest knowledge about English housing reform to Central Europe. In terms of Ebenezer Howard's scheme, Germany was literally the translator of his vision to Central Europe, and the German Garden Cities Association was to play a significant role in introducing the new urban reform also in the Czech lands. The genuine year for the Garden City movement, the starting point in the Czech lands, was the year 1911. In that year, it marks two key initiatives that heavily contributed to the dissemination of the reform idea in the Czech lands. The media chosen for the vision's promotion range from an instructive exhibition to a book on a distinctive development in Prague. In 1911, Architect and leading Garden City's advocate, Ladislav Blaže, organized an exhibition loan from the Deutsche Gartenstadt Gesellschaft. For the first time, the touring exhibition with the simple name Garden City's Exhibition was displayed in October 1911 in Prague, followed by subsequent exhibitions in three other small Czech towns. The exhibition showcased various model settlements and garden cities from the United Kingdom and Germany, employing plans, pictures and photographs. The actual impact of the exhibition was twofold. Reading Blaget's understanding of the garden city indicates its slightly shifted framing. On the contrary to Ebenezer Howard's complex vision of urban reform facilitating the desired social reform, Blaget emphasized more simple benefits like the economic model, healthy environment, and evasion of devastating land speculation. Moreover, displaying garden cities, model settlements, and garden suburbs under the umbrella title Garden Cities Exhibition contributed to an initial confusion of the meaning. In this sense, in the upcoming years, many garden city protagonists felt a pressing need to clarify the significance of the garden city again and again. Next to the modern town planning discussions that the exhibition raised, it had a direct impact on the garden city movement in the Czech lands. Resulting from a housing reform campaign that it had fueled, pioneers of the garden city movement founded the Committee for the Establishment of a Garden City in Prague in 1912. The sole aim of the committee was to introduce the utopian scheme to the Czech capital. Despite many respected members who keenly promoted the Garden City vision, they never accomplished their objective in its totality. If the committee for the establishment of a Garden City failed in Prague, someone else succeeded. So, on a limited scale, when Tomáš Veltz introduced his private development in 1911. On his vast estates in Krč, southwards from Prague, Veltz founded a garden suburb that he overtly called the Garden City Krč. 
It was the first example of misusing the term for marketing purposes in the Czech lands. Tomáš Veltz was an entrepreneur, not a philanthropist, and he had never intended to build a garden city in its complex meaning. He conceived a mere garden suburb, mainly for the middle class, and it was the trajectory that prevailed in Czechoslovakia in the aftermath of the war. Also in 1911, in the period when Czech Garden City movement set off, the highly acknowledged architect Jan Kotěra, one of the founding members of the Committee for the Establishment of a Garden City, remodeled a villa for Tomáš Baťa in Zlín. Baťa, an astonishingly his industrious shoemaker, must have been satisfied with Kotěra's intervention. Since he secured supplies for the Austro-Hungarian army during the World War I, he appointed the architect Kotěra with another task. The rapid boom in shoemaking production demanded an appropriate infrastructure for the workers to be built in the remote small town. In the course of the war, Tomáš Baťa and Jan Kotěra aimed to translate a garden city to Zlín. In the joint venture dating back to 1915, they searched for a new form in town planning and architecture to facilitate an efficient industrial community. The generous arrangement was located on a sloping hill next to the Baťa factory. The western part was to be comprised of family houses, the eastern in the vicinity of the old town, larger irregular blocks for offices and numerous public buildings, such as a school, hospital or a cinema. In their effort, Baťa and Kotěra conceived a workers' colony, enabling the inhabitants of rural origin an easy transition to urban society. The means to achieve a friendly environment were not just dispersing family houses with generous gardens on the spacious meadows, but founding a central cooperative farm with two branches. The farms would provide agricultural tools for the traditional activity in villages. In this sense, the new town extension would have met Howard's principles, merging town and countryside, industrial society, and people with rural backgrounds, incorporating both agricultural and industrial production. But the complex building program was never accomplished. In the war's aftermath, Tomáš Baťa abandoned his utopian visions. Now he was at the forefront of scientific management that led him to reconsider the efficiency of modern housing on a more rational scale. Kotěra, preferring sophisticated, sophisticated landscaping, was not in charge of the new development anymore in the early 1920s, when the housing was shaped by far, far higher density than intended earlier. Also, all public amenities, cooperative farms and a green belt were excluded from the scheme that eventually encompassed only housing. The final output paralleled the functionalist town zoning rather than the utopian vision conceived in the course of the war. The eventual output of Kotira's extension in Zlin, reduced to mere housing, resembled other parallel developments in interwar Czechoslovakia. The Czechoslovak authorities fostered building new neighborhoods on a large scale to address an acute housing problem in the aftermath of the war. A garden city was one option that many visionaries coming from different fields of expertise sought to establish. They expected that the radical transformation of the political landscape in Europe in 1918 would be paralleled by analogous revolution in urban reform among early examples of approaches to the housing crisis was Orechovka in Prague. The new settlement for civil servants was planned as a model colony. To receive the best scheme, the Ministry of Public Works organized an architectural competition in 1919. The competition program and prominent location of the development close to the Prague Castle attracted dozens of architects who submitted their proposals. The final output followed several rules and one of the distinctive features was direct access to a private garden available to every unit. 
In Orzechówka, some of the centrally located structures with brickworks and half timber gables recalled the arts and craft cottages. Eventually, Orzechówka highlighted the limits of post-war town planning. The new developments remain commonly reduced to housing, effectively restricting any industry or agriculture. Parallel to Orzechovka, the 1920s witnessed a town planning boom in Czechoslovakia. On the winner's side, the Czech majority welcomed the founding of the Czechoslovak Republic as a new beginning. In this sense, the year 1918 meant not only an end of the war, but rather a starting point for a new historical stage that had a lasting impact on a broad range of local cultural production, including housing reform, town planning, and also the Garden City movement. The early 1920s witnessed a boom of cherishing the English urban vision in Czechoslovakia. Like other European countries affected by the war, also in Czechoslovakia, desperately needed affordable housing to meet the heightened demand on the, once the conflict was over. Furthermore, garden cities seemed to be an option for a post-war society. In 1921, after years of preliminary discussions, the Society of Establishment of Garden Cities in the Czechoslovak Republic was eventually founded. Only a year later, the Institute for Town Planning uh, was established and one of his official missions was to literally found garden cities. In 1923, Raymond Anvin visited Prague and was treated like international celebrity there. In the subsequent year, Henry Chapman, organizing secretary of the International Garden Cities and Town Planning Federation, arrived in the Czechoslovak capital. And finally, in 1924, Ebenezer Howard's treaty, Garden Cities of Tomorrow, was translated in the Czech language. Despite all the efforts, to a great astonishment to the Czech Garden Cities advocates, no Garden City was eventually built in Czechoslovakia. The initiatives of leading figures were not paralleled by any efficient translation of the English urban vision into local post-war reality. Still, for the Czechs, the urban scheme was to encompass meanings of national solidarity, social reform, and the new beginning. Given the economic decline in the 19, early 1920s and the pressing need to build missing infrastructure and numerous public buildings, there were no financial resources available to introduce Howard's scheme in a complex and coherent way. Instead of demanding the totality of the reform vision, the Czechoslovaks opted for a more feasible solution, the garden suburbs. Based on the state subsidies, the government fostered vast housing programs for cooperatives that built the new low-density settlements on outskirts of the towns on a large scale. On contrary to the tenements that dominated the urban growth in the 19th century, the new society was to be housed in a more suitable buildings. In the 1920s, following the moral, hygiene and architectural criteria, the Czechoslovak society prioritized a small house with a garden as the model dwelling for a healthy and modern family. Thus the garden suburbs like Orechovka were appropriated by the Czechoslovak authorities as the proper response to the pressing housing crisis. The garden suburbs spread across the country. A number of leading architects was commissioned to design town layouts for the new settlements, coupled with plans for the buildings. The garden suburbs comprised chiefly of detached, semi-detached or terraced houses. The new neighborhoods coined not only middle-class comfort, but moreover they found it a base for a social transition, since a vast part of city dwellers in the 1920s was the first generation of migrants from the countryside. For these people, the private house symbolized not only their newly gained social status, but also a fitting expression of their rural-urban background. The garden suburbs blurred boundaries between the original and newly acquired lifestyle. In general, the new neighborhoods contributed significantly to Czech national identity. 
Today, the interwar garden suburbs manifest a twofold symbolic meaning for the Czech society, architectural heritage and living environment. The interwar Czechoslovakia is retroactively praised for its values of modernity, democracy and progress. In this respect, modern architecture and town planning mark a fundamental part of the material culture of the 1920s and 1930s. From the historical point of view, the garden suburbs are not perceived as a cultural import stemming from the United Kingdom or Germany. On the contrary, they are praised as an ultimate output of Czechoslovak democratic society. Yet the cultural legacy is closely intertwined with a nostalgia that simplifies the history and the very lifestyle of the interwar period. In the 1920s, the garden suburbs provided accommodation for a limited number of city dwellers, mainly from the middle class. The garden paradise wasn't any social incubator for the masses of workers or lower classes, as Howard conceived his reform model. And social segregation is even more amplified today due to rapid gentrification. Many garden suburbs became convenient and sought after living areas. Ownership of a house located in a prominent neighborhood is beyond the reach of the majority of households, and the garden suburbs, principally in the bigger towns, are often subject to investment. With the influx of more affluent inhabitants or investors, the garden suburbs are also exposed to perazis con conversions of the built environment. No matter what kind of level of, or level of monument protection applies to the districts, the newly acquired properties are frequently transformed in a radical way. After several decades under a totalitarian rule, the Czech society struggles to accept some limits of the legal system. The intricate monument protection is an obvious example of the current sentiments. But the totality affected also the housing standards that were often reduced to production of vast and anonymous housing estates. Thus the political change in 1989 introduced new freedoms and one of them was a shift in the dwelling. Recalling the interwar idyll, many people feel entitled to own a detached house with a garden and it has a range, range of negative impacts on both the towns and the countryside. The expanding urban sprawl transforms the landscape on a large scale. Ebenezer Howard envisioned garden cities as a conceptual tool to decentralize overcrowded towns and industrial centers. One of the key features for the reform model was a viable public transport connecting new settlements with the centers of production. Other key principle was introduction of green belt that would delineate the border between the town and the countryside. Today, we know that achieving a social change by building garden cities is a utopian task. But we shall learn from the principles that shape the urban form and the public transport and the green belt as the starting point for the future. Relying on public transport and setting limi limits to urban growth could be the vivid legacy of garden cities. Since communities will be heavily affected by climate change, we need to take into account achievements that provide productive in the past and adapt for the future. And coming to the conclusion, I would like to emphasize that also Franz Kafka traveled by train on his journey to Hellerau. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. On va peut-être euh, voilà, passer aux échanges avec la salle. Donc on va faire tourner des... des... We're going to have an exchange with the room. And pass around the microphone. Bonjour. Euh, on se présente ou pas oui. Donc Anne Braquet. Euh... Anne Braquet. Ah. I had a question about the Floreal uh, housing unit. You spoke about cooperatives. Could you explain a little bit how they were put together? 
what their, you know, the, the bylaws were, how they worked in terms of governance. We need a microphone, sir. Thank you. In Belgium, right after the war, the first thing of importance that can be said is that for the first time in Belgium, we had a government in 2019 that was a national union. And for the first time, it included a certain number of socialist ministers. And these socialist ministers had a condition to their participation that there would be a true movement in favor of social housing. And th at this time, the National Society of, uh, uh, of uh, Low-Cost Housing and there are two types of garden cities that were for workers or almost for workers or for low income housing. One, so there were communal housing systems or cooperative systems. Now, the cooperative systems were uh, cooperators who paid, who do not buy, they rent. And the actual rental will make it possible to reimburse over a very long period the expenditure of construction and uh, and, uh, and building of the city. And for this to work, the government has to make it possible for very long-term loans to be uh, obtained. I think it was 66-year loans. And in addition, ultimately, at a, a fixed rate, which were very low interest rates compared to the rates at the time. So the cooperative borrowed from the government the money required to build the housing units, and gradually this was reimbursed through the low rents paid in by cooperators, and gradually the debt of the government was paid back. In addition, There was also help provided in the system that couldn't work by itself. There were a certain number of uh, public actors intervened. Uh, the government, and mainly the communities and provinces, and to a certain extent, in some cases, uh, there were some generous donors participated as well in the funding. I'm sorry, we didn't hear the question. It's a cooperative system. So it's a group of people who decide to build. A, a city in the Logis Florial, for example. Florial originally was designed, you know, the basic uh, thing was uh, topographers, so they're workers, and the work uh, that they're uh, letters that ha they were literate because they're working in, in, in the newspaper industry. But the housing was basically a low cost housing for employees of very low revenue. Hi. Uh, excuse me. Um, my name is Susan Parham. I'm a scholar from the UK. Um, it was fascinating to hear all the presentations focusing on food and garden cities. And as you know, it was a really key part of Ebenezer Howard's model. Um, I've myself been working in this area on Edible Cities Network project, looking at reconnecting um, cities and the food system and of course the garden city is very well set up to do that. So I'm really interested to hear from um, the panel um, your thoughts on how these um, examples, the projet, you know, orchards, the potager, um, uh, vegetable gardens, both domestic and more shared um, as the master planning of garden cities showed, how that model might be used more broadly as part of our green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, um, resilience, and even connecting with rewilding, as I think was shown in one of the um, uh, projects. So your further thoughts on how we might um, disseminate those uh, lessons and how they might apply in other retrofitting and new development settings. Thank you for the question part of the original scheme and in the Czech lands, in the Czech Republic, it uh, somehow survived into current time because there were the facts uh, of the origin of the first city dwellers in those garden suburbs, so they kept their private horticulture gardens. And there's the historical evolution that after the, well, 
in, 19, in 1940s with the uh, Second World War and with the totalitarian <laughs> rise, the people were actually forced to keep their vegetable gardens in order to get some nutrition. And there was additional effect in the late like 1970s, 1980s, when the landscape was richly devastated by the heavy industry in Czechoslovakia, that people turned their attention to their private uh, gardens to achieve like more bio <laughs> production. It changed after 1989 when there was a new fashion of flower gardens that replaced this private production. But uh, facing the current situation, people are turning back as the energy prices rise, that they think that they will again have to uh, provide their own nutrition at home. So there are many facts that influence it, and I think it's one of the positive impacts of garden cities. Uh, my question comes from the intervention by Benedict about uh, the Michelin city. In fact, this section has to do with deriving value from garden cities in the urban policy using this label, which is qualifying in a certain sense for, uh, for workers cities and it's part of the marketing really, both cultural and urbanistic and even touristic. So what should one think in these different cases? I think that the other cases that were presented obviously can be, and I think that uh, one has to wonder uh, right now, uh, possibly in a critical way, about what uh, generalized usage it could be abusive or excessive uh, usage with a view uh, uh, to m uh, uh, marketing, even though, all, even though we all defend the ideas of garden cities. What do you think about this qualification by the local urban planning uh, approach? I hope that the other speakers can respond to that as well. Thank you. Very certainly, we can see the possible effects in labeling things, and there's a sociological uh, effect but I think in Clermont-Ferrand, there's a project, there's a, there are people that have been working since 1918 on, on this type of garden, but there's no longer, there isn't yet a mark, excessive marketing usage of that. It doesn't seem that that's where we're at. In the urban planning, um, there is an outside company from an outside urbanist to the city in that urban planning program. There are Parisians that use the system. We exchange with them. For them, it's not either, you know, a very extended choice. It's just a facility. It's an image that they have, but it's not really, hasn't been picked much up much in the city. But this year, 10 years ago, Brigitte visited the Michelin city and the Garden city in Chantieu. And that visit took place, but there are some very recent factors. It seems to me that we're not yet, in, haven't yet reached an abuse of the label in Clermont. But it's clear that gradually that could take shape, and that could go beyond, uh, escape the control of, the, of the, those involved. So we decided, and many of us considered that we had. There's a whole idea of localization with respect to the uh, landscape and the, and, the, and the slopes involved. And, and it's interesting to see in, in these snapshots that we've seen, we see the whole city. And we're very close to the city center. And this is the biggest city on the plain. So the situations are very, situations are very different with different populations. And the transformation of those populations from a sociological point of view change differently as well. So the d evolution in these cities, in the Michelin City Jardin, is not necessarily linked to the qualification of that, whether you, you try to apply that image or not. It has to do with the micro-local situation so that they evolve in one way or another. So typically, one can consider that there's a beginning of a sociological transformation, but this is not gentrified. But you can see 
that at La Plaine is quite different. So it's micro-local, and the situations are quite independent of the whole issue of labeling as a city garden. But uh, but I think that they could they could meet up. I would like to add something uh, we showed Oradu and the project of the 90s. It is a way to take care about landscape and give an ambition on the gardens that did not uh, exist initially and have a coherence. Uh, we said that these uh, uh, city gardens could allow to the city to have a different approach to the territory and uh, start thinking that uh, gardens and uh, landscape uh, infrastructure could allow to create again a coherence. I would like to give an element of answer with an announce I sell the pavilion next to the C for 60,000 euros. So this is announcement actually you can see in the press and I agree with what is said by our colleagues. It's not a garden city but it's a gentrification Uh, of uh, real estate uh, agencies uh, because uh, the prices are very low. Uh, mid 80s uh, buildings uh, are multiple and uh, uh, sold. And even during the COVID period, uh, that was a very big change. We had people that uh, invest from Paris and come uh, uh, to buy a pavilion uh, for reasons of uh, return on investment uh, or because uh, the seaside is not far away. But as well, there's an alternative. What happens of the people that go and take the microphone later on? They live over there, and they want to continue having something. Uh, because I remember something that bought a building uh, for speculation and investment uh, in order to rent it, uh, because he was interested by the building in the city garden that has its own identity. And he wanted to meet the local inhabitants uh, did he also buy a second uh, property in the area? Is he living there himself? But I believe it's important that the history of the city and of this uh, area, the garden city, is not an artificial uh, construction. I would like to react uh, for the city gardens, uh, that uh, is uh, something that we cannot create uh, in the city of today. Is it a provocation if we say it's uh, intractable or uh, impossible to have it? Uh, is it a question of uh, radicality? Should we talk uh, more of a complementarity with other areas of the city and uh, uh, say uh, we need the city of course, I was provoking and it wouldn't like to dissolve the city garden. What I'm trying to say it is Howard presented something very centralized, very autarkical, and I'm convinced that the city gardens have the interest of they use their own music in a harmony which is much larger. It is the city gardens that will allow to the whole city to become a city garden. Uh, another comment uh, linked to your question. If we use the uh, example of Logis Floreal, we do realize that there was a strange uh, phenomenon and quite interesting actually, that aesthetics uh, of this uh, walking area this uh, neighborhood of walkers had an influence of uh, how the surroundings uh, were organized uh, for landscape uh, and for questions that we also had in uh, Japan, for example, which is a great example, that uh, you will see that step by step this typology of aligning uh, gardens like a uh, Japanese style, you found them in Guatemala before and they were copied in other areas, in other neighborhoods in Brussels. And we have uh, information 
of a census that we received the cherry trees of Japan, which seems to be a very interesting phenomenon that we will use Japanese cherry trees to have the lines and the alleys and the streets and we had an impact on the urbanistic evolution of the city, at least for the landscape. Hello, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I live in Cité Jardin in Soren. We live well here, although uh, all what you have described, uh, we do experience it uh, here as well. That means that we have uh, less equipment when uh, people leave uh, schools, uh, kindergartens, uh, we will have only one. Uh, uh, nurseries, uh, health uh, centers, uh, uh, local uh, uh, shops, uh, and uh, trade and uh, commerce. Uh, we still do have uh, uh, primary and secondary school, but we still live uh, quite well. But with our uh, city gardens, we all have something that says that they correspond to uh, our modern times. We have environment. Uh, we have to be more concentrated uh, to elements uh, like uh, yeah, it has to be something with uh, municipalities uh, of uh, every day. And I would like to say, like the lady from uh, saint Brian, the city has been um, badly marked because of the environment, uh, because uh, we have on a European level, how could I say that? Uh, we're a bad pupil. We need to ask to our new government, I'm talking about France, that should take into consideration the events and the public aspect. I would like to keep this public aspect because it has been done with public funds and it's not normal. I hear and people say that's the way it is. No, I refuse to say that's the way it is. I don't want to sell and I don't want that these uh, areas uh, be sold. It has to be taken into consideration. People pay their rent, and there's absolutely no reasons to stop making uh, renovations on sell their apartments, uh, because why will the people go leave if they cannot afford another rent or uh, going to the private sector, because uh, this is public sector. So we know the situation, actually, uh, that everybody has financial difficulties uh, for many families of our neighbors. Uh, and for me, uh, it is uh, a good thing that uh, the residents are uh, being taken into consideration. Uh, and I thank the mayor for whatever he has said, that the city garden should be the example of a city. And I'm going to remind him on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, a common question to our Czech colleague and to our British colleague. There's something common between these two countries, that is a privatization of uh, elements of uh, inheritance uh, of a whole society. I have seen in Central Europe, especially in Bulgaria and in Poland, privatizations that are, to my understanding, is catastrophic. And what would be the possibility of having co-ownership? Uh, they seem to be very bad. And uh, inhabitants uh, lost their homes because of decisions that had been taken on other level for economy and for energy. And it's very difficult to get a credit today to improve your energy performance of your home. So there are difficulties for managing uh, the inheritance and the buildings, especially towards uh, being more energy efficient or having a better comfort of life. Often these lodgings are very 
bad uh, as a thermal sieve. And the thermal sieve means uh, you uh, uh, heat not only your house, but also the environment. And uh, I want to know, do you have a gentrification in Czech Republic? Uh, will you have sufficient investments uh, and allow uh, a collective solution adapted and have uh, interventions like Madame Thatcher uh, sold uh, thousands of uh, lodgings and the uh, Prime Minister today, you cannot uh, foresee what uh, happens for your uh, public housing uh, heritage. How can it be uh, adapted? You need investments, and will you continue having uh, people that will be supported and help them sustain the financial effort and be able to live in those houses with a uh, reduced rent? Uh, that is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Next question, <laughs> but I'm happy to respond some of, some of the points. So funds. The other thing is gentrification. If you had visited Prague, you see that it's <laughs> very radically shifted, and uh, gentrification is uh, consumpting uh, district after district, neighborhood after neighborhood. But it doesn't always have a negative effect. I think the problem is not gentrification itself, but uh, Airbnb as in other many metropolis. And naturally, there is also housing crisis in the Czech Republic. Thank you. Yes, it's been a, a, a real a curse left for us by Madame Thatcher. Um, but in, in one sense, Letchworth provides the, the model for, for countering this with its it's uh, the only garden city which has retained uh, community land ownership and, uh, and uh, which s still allows the uh, uh, collection of uh, improved land value by the community rather than uh, as a private benefit. So um, Wellen, Wellen, which um, was completely privatized under the New Towns administration, uh, Letchworth has uh, I think the, the only example that I've seen which, which actually implemented Howard's vision of community ownership and community land banking, yeah, uh, which it achieved through an act of parliament, ironically, under the Thatcher government <laughs> at a time when uh, privatization was, uh, was uh, in full force. Uh, on prend une dernière intervention. It will be the last uh, comment. I would have a small question. I work on urbanism and I'm working on a program, a program right now for Cité Jardin and maybe create a program of uh, city garden in the 21st century knowing uh, the problems that we do have uh, of today for real estate. Uh, we ask uh, ourselves uh, of the fundamentals of uh, a property uh, zones around uh, the property, and we do work on a new program that would take into consideration the evolutions of uh, modus vivendi and the way that uh, uh, city gardens would be perceived as a conception of uh, lodging uh, that is uh, on the long term. And we are all very enthusiastic about it. Uh, uh, my question uh, was, uh, you presented saint Prieur as a collective. Uh, what I did not perceive, uh, having these buildings living uh, uh, as of today, but what I didn't perceive is the link between this collective uh, and uh, the territory, and the gardens, uh, and the landscape. So how this idea of collective uh, city gardens is linked with nature, and what's the link with residents? You're talking about a collective that we discover of public housing. It's in the beginning of the city. You have a square with a collective building 
the common building, uh, the big collective of each side. Behind the common building, you have a public garden that was collective, and several streets uh, that have a form of a fish with houses uh, of individual uh, houses for small and big families who have all kinds of apartments, and there's still a smaller collective uh, which is in the style of New Normanda, and everybody has his own private garden behind. Am I answering to your question? The person speaking is not using the microphone. <laughs> If we speak about the city garden, what happens with the families that live in this collective? What is the link with the gardens? Is it the square? And uh, you have uh, a common house. Uh, somebody speaking of the mic. Voilà. Voilà. Je, je, je redis pour les gens qui traduisent. Donc, uh, Annika. I'm going to repeat uh, the question. Annika, who's going to talk later on, explained that there were gardens that won't be owned by the families attached to the collective apartments. And that's great. We can now start with the round table. Thank you very much. I just wanted to indicate that uh, this room, which dates back to 1935-37, doesn't have air conditioning. So we are, but at the same time, it's good for the planet. There's a little bit of ventilation, but you won't have um, much fresh air. Oh, we could open the door. We need to open that door. On the break, I'll do that. Change the plug of electricity. I don't want to avoid that everything. No, it's more cold. No. It's more cold. No. I don't know. Milena is going to be uh, running this. Who's going to be taking over for this uh, panel discussion? We will have 30 minutes, uh, 35 maybe, of exchange, and then roughly 20 minutes for uh, an exchange with the floor. So we've had to shorten this a little bit. I know there are still some questions, but you can maybe ask those during luncheon. Hi, everyone. I'm Milena Crespo. I'm the former uh, animator uh, of the Société Jardin de Défense. I am, I am a teacher for the city of Saint Quentin in Yvelines. Today, it is my pleasure to uh, moderate this on the valuation of city gardens, and I'd like to thank the association for as in my new function and my old function. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to the people that are around the table and what they do, in a few words, before we move on to further details. First of all, Edith Loton, who is in charge of the Architecture and Heritage Department and who runs the Architecture and Heritage Organization in Strasbourg. Edith will be talking to us about the city garden at Stuckfeld. This is a garden where in 2010 they have their 100 year anniversary of, of garden cities with six months of festivities. We could also talk about all of the problems having to who is an engineer in, in urban systems in charge of developing heritage actions with Rouen, Normandy. This is an area that has a label which performed uh, uh, elaborated recommendations and along with the urban area and c council 
for the restoration and maintenance. And the metropolitan area, which has a, uh, actions tending to uh, uh, improve the value. Next to her, we have Annie Cam, who's a member of the Cam, who's a member of the Habitant Guide Collective. So this is coordinated by Cap Couleur and the, the CAF of the Côte d'Amour, and is supported by uh, the city of saint -Brieuc. And he represents the, the whole group of uh, this, uh, the Cap Colau, and they're in the room. So this project is to give people a voice and to f facilitate uh, visits, and everybody contributes their own memories um, in different ways in, a, in an approach that's sensitive to garden cities. And lastly, we have Anne Braquet, who is a landscaper and a designer at the CAUE in the north. And she's talking about deliverance, which is based on the com commune, which is attached to the L city of Lille. It is, and so the deliverance uh, garden city uh, celebrated its 100 year anniversary last year with a whole lot of activities that she'll talk about in connection with that. Uh, Cité Cheminot is called. So much for the presentation of our panelists, and I'd like to give over, hand over to Annie so that you can present uh, perhaps a bit quickly what you do, why you're here, and what your actions are. And um, just for your information, in fact, there are some pictures of different uh, garden cities and the different places we're going to be seeing, and I'm going to be uh, running through these. So the image doesn't necessarily correspond to what's being sent, said, but you'll at least see all the different places we're going to be talking about uh, right now. So just a word, we became Habit and Guide because we depend on the social center that is a support for this. We couldn't work without them. We had a new project for organizing the territory, and there are several of us, both professionals and um, and we realized that there were different from different places, but we didn't know the area where our friends lived. So we had the idea of doing a little discovery trip, and it's subsequent to that that we realized we had some many things to say. And I was working on Cité Jardin because I was living there. I was lucky to live there because I had some great years of my life, and I, when I was until I was six. Yes. And then I was living there when I was six. I had no idea. And I learned only later the interest of that and the history of, of garden cities. I didn't know I was in a, a garden city. I know my, my house was unusual. We were happy there. Um, there are many exchanges. And so we did research. And there are many things to be said about that. And we had a real passion uh, for history and we did research by ourselves, as Yolen said. We weren't contacted right away. We didn't know. We discovered that later. We went to the archives to look uh, out, to seek out all of the um, information, and we got passionate about it. So the whole team of us, uh, and everybody had their own passions, and we realized that with, with these uh, walks that we took, as Yolen said, we went to the, the garden cities, but the opening up to the Santif home with the, the plan and the Balzac uh, area and the famous towers that were built in 62. And we compared the Cité Jardin and the Balzac city, which one, one uh, two are, are going to be de demolished in, in a year or two. And we draw the parallel be between the two. And there's such an interest in the newspapers and so forth. We were contacted by the schools. We did walks. We were all pa uh, very passionate about this. And we had Roman, who's a, a, a deputy. I'm laughing because uh, so we are partners. And we, and we tell very well this, really, the story. I was talking about the collective action. We're telling the story. But each apartment have, had its own little garden. They were just down, downstairs. And 
evolution made it that it was a, a city, a university city for youth and culture. And on the square, in, and in work as well, in partnership, these are ways in Rouen with the Café Patrimoine. There's also an important room that leaves room for citizens and structures. In Rouen, we started initially on Dutre, which is a city garden, and we moved forward with our partners from PNR, the regional national parks, to understand the, the garden cities and to continue to keep it alive and live with its time. And we started by recognizing city gardens by the city. There are 71 townships in Rouen, and there are 30 uh, garden cities. And we had to find information and resources for 15 to this, which um, gave uh, birth to a huge exhibit with 15 towns. We tried to run this through all of those townships, and we had actions that were both awareness raising about these garden cities for technicians and elected officials, because a lot of work needed to be done on that end, and for inhabitants that live in these city garden cities and for people that live outside them. For example, last year, we set up our little exhibit, or, or our roving exhibit, that was the same as we uh, seen together. And the Café Patrimoine, the idea was to present what a city garden was, a garden city was, and what people lived there, and to ask them a question, you know, how do you keep the city alive today? And notably, with all of the renovations and the isolation of things, and that people that need to live in a decent housing because of the garden cities in the last century the standards were not the same for habitability as they are now, and how do you accompany them in order to make it possible to live properly in these housing units, but to respect the heritage of uh, garden cities as they, as they exist. In that particular dimension of continuity, it's true that in Stockfeld, in the 100-year anniversary, was also an opportunity to, to think about an extension of the city. And during the 100-year anniversary, we also had a lot was said about uh, the value of the heritage and that we involved the public. I'd like to start with the first questions. The 100-year anniversary was in 2010, and that was a point in time where the city <coughs> was thinking about a bigger urban project, and we were thinking about the best way to build the city of the future sustainably. And also to, to celebrate the anniversary of the Garden Cities and to ask questions about the different models we could have implemented over different centuries. And the anniversary was, there was a, there's a competition for an extension. There was a, by Strasbourg Architects, which included the funding people that are historically funded housing in Stockfeld, and another cooperative for social action in access to property. And we imagine this as an extension to existing garden cities with uh, relatively different shapes, even though we kept certain structural items, such as a double slope roof, and uh, an approach that's different in terms of density, because the city garden are one of the least dense areas of the city because you, no longer, uh, you can no longer allow yourself to do that anymore, given the density issues. And depending, and with a different relationship to the garden, because in one of the gardens, we have one that's directly attached to a housing unit. Um, and in the other, you, they've made a choice of having a, a shared garden. And I think that uh, in the deliverance uh, city garden, in the framework of this 100 year anniversary, we realize that g garden cities, well, there are decade uh, celebrations as well in the Paris area as well. So it's true that these are important moments in time um, where you realize wh what value they have. And, and this is to cover, the costs are covered in part by the local community with the Strasbourg metropolitan area, but also by the CAEU and they're important m m participants in these um, in these activities, as it was the case with La Divrance, La Livrance. In the Livrance, 
in 2018 for the 100 year anniversary from the memory of the war of uh, 1924, 1914, 1918. We're able to compare city garden cities in the north, various uh, city gardens in the north. We had tech textile, we had a railway employees and so forth. But, and the idea was that in the idea of sustainable development and the way we're moving forward and building cities, there are parallels. There are factors of fostering dialogue in the way things are designed in the north and the eco uh, neighborhoods that are being built in big cities just about everywhere, especially in Lille. And we targeted uh, the deliverance uh, garden city. So it so happened that the mayor, there is a mayor who wanted to draw value from the city, which is not classified, it's not you know enrolled, uh, but it is in the new uh, urban planning plan. No, it's in Clermont-Ferrand. It was in, in the it was in the SPR, in fact. So. So there are kind of strict rules that are applicable in the way in which you extend these areas and you attach annexes to try to maintain the urban structure uh, and the way the city is built. We had a visiting a visitor's book that I designed. The idea was to base this on local associations. There's one historical association which also provided visits to go as far as we could possibly go in dialogue with participants to show that the city had changed. We had several opinions. There was a big uh, bombing in 1944 by the Allies and half of the city was destroyed and then rebuilt. And today, after difficulties with the funding, the last funders of SNCF in the city are rehabilitating and decided to build new part of extensions that were very well designed because they called upon architects that themselves had followed the specs that were that were designed ahead of time, and landscapers that work, reworked the relationship with uh, gardens before and with streets and with uh, um, uh, fences and so forth and the uh, types of trees planted, but e evolving that concept towards intermediate housing and individual housing, not no collective housing. And the collective housing would be more dense with garages, carport where there wasn't before. All of this was very well done. So the idea was to show that things are changing, but there are examples of change and a soft transition with urban densification, which is measured in high, very qualitative. Oui, donc sur ces sur cette. Absolutely, and on this aspect of extension of uh, thinking about the way how to rehabilitate. Uh, it uh, will be mentioned this afternoon of prevention of uh, city gardens and uh, some other projects of uh, uh, whatever we had. And uh, Friday afternoon, we're going to talk about all these things. So these reflections uh, will be linked of how are we going to be able to influence uh, and create a new model for tomorrow. I hear as well that uh, there is a dynamic and a wish of uh, this 100 year celebration uh, to plan and uh, project uh, oneself to the future. How is it in Strasbourg and in Rouen? In Strasbourg, uh, what happened after the 100 years of uh, anniversary? Uh, and uh, then I will ask the city of Rouen, let's start with uh, Strasbourg and in Rouen. There's a question on the link. Uh, of uh, you know that the landscape uh, and vegetation is very important uh, uh, for uh, your region. I would start uh, like to say so what we have done for this 100th anniversary. It was uh, six months of programs and events with visits and conferences. Uh, so that schools would visit their different uh, districts uh, from associations and uh, walking uh, uh, during the evening and night uh, with uh, light uh, and uh, different other illuminations. 
this is a way to present uh, the urbanism and uh, the recognition of uh, how it is useful and nice to have uh, Duplan Square, which is the central square of uh, the district. In 2014, we have been recognized as a city of history, and we have a cultural and architectural presentation of our heritage, and uh, you can visit uh, the city uh, in spring and in autumn, and these visits are organized for the schools. We have a medical structure and then deployment of uh, signals uh, for the history and the patrimony in uh, Justifrenne, which is a city garden, and it's part of our way of uh, uh, having a fifth area of the city, and presenting it in Ugelmark, which is another city garden in our territory and more recently we had a podcast that presents the city garden either on site or when Stockfeld is very much away from the city center. In our city the main elements was the exposition 2018 in Elbeuf where we had uh, during four months uh, uh, more than uh, 1,600 visitors, uh, uh, people living there in the neighborhood or uh, tourists coming from farther away. And during these four months, uh, we had uh, more than 100 events. Uh, you could uh, visit some uh, uh, garden cities, uh, some uh, theater performances, uh, uh, paintings for the children's uh, workshops uh, for leisure and free time to show what you can do, and uh, not only for the youngerly, but also for the elderly. And at the end, uh, we had a discussion club uh, in the factory of Elbeuf, uh, where at the end of a uh, two-day conference uh, like this one, uh, we included all the inhabitants, uh, scientific speakers, and people that would speak about uh, uh, city gardens of today and tomorrow, and at the end of the exposition, we said we won't stop here, and we imagined how to travel. Uh, we made an exposition that went to five different uh, communities uh, in uh, uh, visits, uh, workshops, and other expositions that we could do for the patrimony. And we also had uh, coffee events, coffee events, uh, to talk about uh, city gardens, how to discover them, and how to. Uh, go to the next bit of uh, transmission. We wanted to keep uh, uh, elements of uh, this uh, exposition that uh, you cannot uh, uh, find, and uh, there's still a mark and a trail that you can uh, use it either in our museum, so we borrow it to other neighboring communities. Uh, we work together with the uh, habitant, uh, and uh, they are in the urban planning. Uh, not all of them are part of the urban planning, but we do work uh, in order to include them. In we also ordered uh, at uh, CHU uh, to make uh, recommendations uh, for the whole metropole uh, city gardens uh, in order to make the diffusion and we had more than 300 homes. If you want to make works and repairments for your home, you live in a city home garden, and you can get the subventions with the architects of the urban planning institutions so that we do respect the spirit of what is modern. And I do remember in order to prepare this round table, I talked with several people and uh, we presented all the experiences, uh, said uh, that uh, there is no service uh, and all the work that has been done is that, uh, that the services are trained and they take uh, what the patrimony value is of uh, these areas and uh, they have to do uh, the maintenance that is necessary in order to stay. We have a partner, Parc Regional, uh, who is in charge uh, to follow up uh, and uh, 
we have to watch out uh, that uh, certain buildings that are renovated, uh, we have to follow up uh, with the services and the community, in which cases uh, they do respect uh, the history and uh, all the norms, uh, for example, external insulation that uh, change the cost of uh, these uh, city gardens. Uh, but uh, we are now with uh, colleagues from the environment uh, that uh, work on uh, uh, the cadastre for energy in order to have an energy efficient house in the whole region of the metropole with recommendations, specifications uh, that integrate the architectural uh, characteristic for these uh, city gardens and help them uh, for their renovation in the harmony with the landscape. So we do see there was an impact on the renovation, and it's not only one-way evolution and influence. Because often we do realize there's a patrimony that is getting older. In Deliverance, it was the same thing. And the city decides to say we have to do something for the renovation. There's a whole policy about uh, uh, renovation and uh, valorization that could accompany and help to improve the requests for upgrades. For the valorization, we also had uh, the question of uh, public. Uh, is it a period to reorganize the areas? And I was wondering for the visits that you do organize, who comes to these visits? Uh, is this uh, guides? Is it professionals? Is it neighbors? Uh, how do you organize it? And what is the impact uh, to the city? Everybody's invited. Uh, we have a social house, and that's uh, the place of departure. We also make announcement on the newspapers, uh, and there is always uh, a cooperation with cultural groups that could come from another area, where they come to saint Brieuc, or they could be from the department, and they like to know what we're doing because they adore what we are making, and uh, many people. Uh, would like to do something similar, and that's uh, why uh, people are interested. Uh, they see we walk around the areas, uh, we wear our T-shirts uh, with the block. Uh, we've seen, uh, you see the shirts with the logo and four colors, and people ask us, uh, what are you cap couleur? What does that mean? Uh, why are you a habitation uh, guide? And we explain there's a walk, and people say, uh, we love what you're doing, that motivates us, and we continue to talk about uh, city gardens. Good, good uh, to do an inventory of uh, all these uh, initiatives, uh, but we like it to be recognized, uh, and uh, uh, it's open to outside people, and uh, we try to include everybody who's interested to make this work with us. And I remember before uh, this event, you said that it's nice to make and create a national network. Uh, we were invited from Yolen, and we realized uh, there are many garden cities all over France. Did you think of what you're doing? Uh, we're going to start talking, and we're very proud of being here today. I was asking myself about the network. Uh, because everybody is responsible in his territory. We recognize and make the valorization on our local uh, department, our city department, uh, metropole, uh, city, different levels. And uh, finally, the question would be, how do you think that this international colloque could help you or could be used as a network that uh, could help exchange on a European level would that have an impact or create a dynamic in your own uh, valorization? For Cité de Livrance, uh, it's a bit complicated uh, because it's not protected. Uh, and uh, finally, many partners uh, start to be interested. We talk about marketing, uh, tourist uh, interest uh, in deliverance. It's uh, uh, 
something that uh, many people would like to buy in. And uh, uh, when something is available, it's sold very fast, and that price is that are extremely high. As of uh, today, there are great values, and the fact that we say it's a city garden that could be a member of a network that is square and uh, is a strong value that would allow us to be better recognized as a system, uh, implying all the elements uh, of solidarity, social values, uh, and for deliverance. Uh, for the 100-year anniversary, some of the values have been presented, and uh, we can allow ourselves uh, to create uh, some interaction with uh, the partners, uh, because Matthew neighborhood is part of the cities uh, that is one of the greenest, not only because of the public spaces uh, that was uh, uh, thanks to the beautiful city, and there are many trees, and it needs uh, big efforts for the green areas and we also have about 100 hectares from a great train station that was used for train and we will put there in the shunting yard lots of trees and will be a great success because uh, this uh, train station is closed uh, and we can use it uh, with metropolitan and public uh, funds. Uh, we also had students uh, and inhabitants and neighbors to show that uh, this uh, patrimony of uh, trees could be useful and uh, become a patrimony of uh, all the neighbors for green areas and as well a potential for active links to the city between the city Lom and Lille. We also had a presentation of our uh, city gardens uh, within a training for teachers. We had uh, three training for teachers uh, and uh, we get more and more requests for other teachers that would like to bring their pupils uh, and uh, visit uh, for uh, sustainable development uh, the pupils. Uh, and uh, visit uh, our cities uh, or the garden cities, and this is an advantage for education. Who else would like to talk? I have two elements. One of my first jobs was Cité uh, Jardin Star in 2006 uh, in Saint Denis, and uh, we had the evaluation of uh, tourists. Uh, and all those days, we had almost nothing to start with. Uh, and uh, we tried to keep uh, the memory, and uh, we realized that City uh, Garden was interesting of being there. She went to uh, the Office uh, of Tourism. She saw there's a visit to Cité Jardin Estan, and uh, she said, people come and visit my place. That means that my place is a nice place, and it's worth living there. So step by step, I realized uh, by testimonies like that, uh, walking in the city of Stan and uh, networks of uh, Ile de France, uh, I realized uh, of the interest to identify these cities and uh, create a network to share our experiences. Uh, and in Rouen, Normandy, we did the same thing. Uh, we were interested in the Cité Jardin Tre, who had a lot of things to say, and uh, it was a discourse about our history. And we do know now it's good to have isolated uh, projects, but also a general view to allow us to better have an approach for renovation, for valorization, recognition, even if it's a little part among other elements that are built together a whole construction in order to be able to present our city gardens, that some of the city gardens I never heard of before, and I'm very happy of being here today. So this is the advantage of meeting people and learning thanks to other experiences. City gardens uh, are part of network. Uh, we have uh, in Germany an organization, Stadtgesellschaft, uh, and it's uh, good to 
having exchange with them and know how they did make their valorization in Stapfeld. Uh, we have uh, books of uh, Jonas Jonas, uh, and uh, he was uh, very mobilized uh, to uh, garden, city gardens in uh, middle Europa and uh, the urban planning. Uh, uh, you can see publications and you saw the presentation of Dresden, uh, that uh, there are many similar things in new regionalism and in the presentation of saint -Brie, you see on homes of Neon-Normand, we also have a uh, Norman houses in Strasbourg, and uh, we call them new Alsatian homes. And this model traveled a lot, and it's uh, nice to be able to have a common view. Before uh, asking uh, if there are any questions in the floor, I have a last question. You've walked a lot for valorization, and it's a lot of uh, visits, expositions, uh, and uh, events. Uh, somebody talked about uh, podcast as well. Are there other ways of uh, gratifying or recognizing uh, your area? And uh, maybe you would like to do some brainstorming and tell me what else could be done. You are a guide. Uh, do you have any specific uh, project that is unbelievable and worth mentioning? Dear friends, what did we mention? We try to continue doing our visits uh, because uh, it has uh, to continue. And we would like uh, to talk with uh, uh, local uh, uh, newspapers. We want to have a continuity and have as many people uh, being informed of this uh, rich local history. And maybe you thought about that? Yes, I proposed for the 100 years of deliverance uh, ambitious things, uh, but I keep my ambitious uh, proposals in my head. It, there could be a festival of gardens uh, that could uh, travel. It could be an event uh, that uh, could be used in the metropolis of uh, Lillois from collective of uh, inhabitants that uh, did that from one city to another, and the title was Windows That Talk. And it was artists and locals that would walk together uh, with the inhabitants and make an exposition on the window. It's done in the month of April of May, uh, and uh, put on the windows uh, paintings, drawings, uh, sculptures, or other uh, works uh, of an artist. And at the end, uh, there is uh, a walk uh, uh, where uh, people would uh, do something like a procession going in front of all these windows and seeing what uh, has been exposed there, ending with the event. Uh, there is uh, Arre Jardin en France uh, that uh, gives a label of recognition on projects for professional artists and uh, landscape uh, artists who walk on site uh, with inhabitants, uh, with uh, collectives, uh, with schools, uh, and uh, they made also memorial uh, gardens. So the idea is make a festival of gardens, of a gardener and an artist, or an artist of landscape, create uh, ephemeral uh, arts, for the walkers uh, of uh, train stations or other walkers. Uh, we hear the valorization as architecture and, and as landscape and as vegetal uh, life uh, dimension. This is the immaterial heritage that we do have all around us. And I think it's time to give the mic to the floor. So who wants to ask a question? So, 
I w went to internet uh, in order to find out of what is digital uh, recognition. I found fantastic documents uh, about uh, several uh, subjects. Uh, I downloaded many documents about the city of Normandy or area of Normandy. I went to the site of uh, regional gardens and I found a lot of things that can be used and I thought it's uh, very useful. But the question is uh, how to integrate the digital dimension with the physical presence. Because I do understand physical presence is extremely important, but if you want to have an international network, you have to use also other means. Anybody wants to answer or say something? We should stop. We should stop. No, it's... Uh... So it would be great to have documents in English and French. Anybody else? The project of the exposition and of the work on the city gardens of uh, Normandy was uh, only for a local purpose. Later on, we wanted to keep uh, trace and uh, uh, know what we did produce, so we created a different uh, websites, uh, publications, uh, and communication uh, that is done by the collectivity, and we wanted to have uh, support from the press. We don't always have the means to publish everything, but uh, we try to diffuse as much as possible all these events. But uh, there are many different elements uh, online. There was a podcast we've done with a local uh, radio. And, uh, we have several postcards ongoing. The city of Stockfeld is an exceptional part of our patrimony. And uh, if you want to discover it, uh, it's uh, quite far away from uh, downtown. Many people from Strasbourg don't know it. So we use 10 elements for this podcast, uh, and I will talk about them later. We also have several uh, documents of a uh, way of uh, how you can uh, uh, walk uh, and have a path uh, through these uh, different uh, buildings, areas. Uh, and there's an architect, uh, Edward Schinkfeld, uh, who received the prizes, uh, who participated in these expositions. And last thing. And we have a digital element uh, of uh, how to go visit uh, Stockfeld. And for the diligence on deliverance, you also have a uh, deliverance and SNCF train company had uh, interviews. Uh, and uh, could you tell us more about it? On deliverance, uh, we have the CHU. And we continue to work with the city gardens, and we have a platform called uh, espace.org. And in that portal, uh, we use all the information. Uh, and uh, there's a specific area, Cité Jardin Ville Nature, Cities of Nature. And it's an exposition that we have collected all the elements of uh, the gardens of the north. And we would like to open the walk to the regional areas of the five CEOs of uh, France. We also had uh, several uh, events uh, uh, during the 100-year anniversary uh, of uh, the Lesser Nord-Est on a building uh, which was emblematic uh, for health care social dispensary that became later on the PMI and we had an important uh, role to pay for uh, uh, France uh, uh, children. And uh, we trained their nurses to become social assistants and that uh, building uh, and uh, that allowed us uh, to be better 
uh, known. So the train company, SNCF, uh, decided together with the LSO to provide this uh, building that was to be uh, given uh, to the city and transferred because it was a ruin and there was a fire and uh, bad weather conditions. So they uh, succeeded uh, that this building can be reused and uh, be reconstructed as it was and be used as housing. And that was an advantage for the LESO. In order to keep uh, the memory of this building and of its activities, uh, we had a memory uh, atelier with the city and the pupils and associations uh, and ECF, uh, as what we called uh, Golden Podcast with a journalist, uh, with a scenario of life and evolution of the building in four episodes. Uh, and it's called The House of the Doctor, and that's the uh, life of uh, the House of the Doctor in four episodes, and you can find that uh, in several sites, including the portal and the SNCF uh, website, four episodes that are very nice. It's a story telling. Any other questions? Patrick Kelly, I'm uh, mayor from uh, Community Tray, and it has been mentioned uh, by other people. I would just uh, like to share a testimony because uh, it's always a question how can we uh, able to find uh, solutions uh, for cities of uh, 300 uh, inhabitants. Uh, uh, we have more than uh, 6,000 within a few years and these workers and these managers and these team leaders uh, uh, needed uh, the support of a company called Worms uh, that uh, created the city garden, and uh, it's a model of Award. And uh, we have a city garden that uh, is uh, present in our area. Thanks to the work done by all the teams, I would like to thank them, including Claude and the other people like uh, Gilles, who is in here, and Gael of PNR Buckle de Seine. I would like to thank them because thanks to this common work, uh, we could uh, realize and uh, get the awareness that we need to keep our patrimony of these uh, city gardens. Uh, thanks to the urban planning, many things have been uh, integrated uh, to protect uh, these uh, unique buildings. Because uh, sometimes uh, we made mistakes and we could need to uh, uh, preserve uh, those buildings. But thanks to uh, common work and efforts. We are very proud to be able to have next to me uh, assistant mayor that uh, works hard on this uh, subject. So what I wanted to say, we need support by elected people. And it's nice to see that also saint Brieux is doing similar things. And the fact uh, to use And I quote uh, these uh, beautiful experiences of having locals as guides is great. And uh, we also have a social assistant uh, and social team, and we are going to share your concept. Last point I want to say is I had the opportunity to have a residence of architects in 2017 we celebrated uh, the naval construction works uh, for their 100 years. And it was a great event because thanks to the architects, we could show and demonstrate that this uh, heritage was still alive. I'm sorry, we are obliged to stop after this last question because some people will go to visit and uh, we have lunch, so I'm sorry, we need to organize, uh, and we can still do other visits tomorrow. So last person, Brest, you know Brest. I would like to thank all the speakers, because for us it's a nice adventure for human beings in social dimension to see 
that uh, it's great to be able to congratulate uh, everybody and I would like to thank Ani most of all. And uh, there were several reactions uh, for the project. Uh, I just want to remind you that the project is part of the willingness of people to accompany the event. So what we have done is uh, there's a desire and there's a force driving coming from people living there and that is something great and we continue since 2020 on the spring of uh, walks through the city gardens uh, we are part of a network and it was very positive and great to realize that being able to be lodged in northeast of Saint Brieuc, we started to talk and being linked with others. So this event today is for us a basis to encourage other people to participate as well and uh, we use it as a communication platform for the institutions that realize it's a great beginning for the projects uh, and having means to act. So, thanks to these different experiences, uh, that was uh, a work done by one single group that became a partnership. We have now a bigger network which is the network of city gardens and this territory shows there's a complementarity it's great to work together we can go much farther together and we can work on the motivation of the people that is something that allows us to continue because as long as there's a challenge we can evolve we had a video conference a few days ago to prepare this event and we understood that it's easier to use modern technology and when this group started had an action principle because we said we have to experiment and try. So we allow it to ourselves to try new things and that makes it easier and lighter to start we need to be flexible, we act, we improve, and we continue. And at the, once our action started, is based on human relationship, on exchange. It's part of everything. And maybe I would like to use your new information. You can find this event on the Facebook network and we are in several networks of uh, social exchange so it's great that uh, you know this event is already online on Facebook uh, and we can go for a walk and uh, discover the garden city and that's uh, really something with a great value for human habitat heritage and uh, the question is always, would you like to participate as somebody living in this area? And we said it's important to participate. So these are my last words, that it's good to be able to project oneself in that frame of mind. Thank you very much. So we have to summarize this round table of the valorization of the patrimony, which is a part of uh, the next steps. So we need motivation that has to be done either by inhabitants, either by services uh, of uh, history, and that will allow to elected people to talk more about it uh, and understand uh, that it's important to rehabilitate the buildings, the environment, the city gardens. So we are inaugurating this event 
with the preservation of buildings, living and uh, lodging in this uh, frame with new experiences, either by extensions or by new neighborhoods. So, thank you very much. I can hear there's a lot of motivation and valorization that are available, that you want to keep the history. You want to remember what exists and the spaces that we do have. I would like to thank everybody for this round table, and Charlotte will give you some practical information. Thank you very much. Merci à Milena et aux intervenantes. Euh, du coup, pour les aspects un peu pratiques, en effet, on finit avec. Euh... So we are 15 minutes late. So uh, visits are booked out for today. If your name is on the list, you can go in front of the theater and go for a walk and visit the school. And I give you a practical information as well that we are starting again at uh, 13.45 for the preservation. So we will be starting at 13.45. So please be back here at uh, 13.40 because there's lots of things to say this afternoon, and I hope we will be able to exchange a lot. And even if you could not write your name on the list, uh, you can still join us. Uh, and if you want to have a break, have lunch, and not go for the visit, uh, there is a possibility to do the visit tomorrow, so you can have a small rest. Thank you very much. Uh, see you later. <laughs>